Okay, we're rolling. Uh, our next interview at the New York 2012 Antiquarian Book Fair is Ian Brabner. And Ian, I'm going to ask you to start things off with this interview by talking a little bit about your parents, siblings, where you were educated. Um, take us, give us a little biopic all the way up to college if you went. Okay. Uh, I'm the youngest of seven. I have five older sisters. Uh, my father was a uh, professor in uh, educational studies at the University of Delaware. Uh, my mother was a mother for the many years that she had to be. And um, they developed uh, kind of a, by necessity uh, a need to go out to auctions and libraries to furnish their homes to get basic utilitarian items for the house. And uh, we lived in a sort of rural environment where this house was filled up with this sort of material, kind of was like a, a gothic American experience, you mm. could say. Uh, I was brought up around all of these old things that I didn't necessarily have them a, a context for what they were, but I could uh, use them and touch them and handle them, and that, and that included books. Uh, and since I was the last in line, uh, the youngest one, about that time, my mother learned how to drive and <laughs> decided that she wanted to get out of the house and take me to all the auctions and book sales and book fairs. And that's pretty much how I spent a lot of my childhood, was uh, at auction houses. And uh, you were a ride victim. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 if I was kind of a, a free scout for my mother to find material, and you know, I was trained to go out and to look for things that she was interested in, either for the house or her own collecting interests. She's, she's interested in everything. How old were you at this time? Uh, seven. <laughs> yeah. So, so she got me started on collecting Oz books and children's books. And I would go into uh, like the Willow Grove Book Fair with a copy of Gene Stratton Porter Firebird and Dust Jacket and go up to a dealer and try to see if I could get some money to buy some Oz books. Uh, and occasionally we would sell at flea markets. Uh, but it was always, that was kind of the week in, week out activity was, was doing that. So that, of course, meant that when I went to college, I was going to become an English and anthropology major, mm. uh, which left me with a lot, of, of, uh, a lot of career options when I graduated. Mm. Uh, and um, that's, that's about the extent of my schooling. I, what I, school did you go to? I went to the University of Delaware. I, I got out of high school in two and a half years, I, I hated the environment. My dad wanted to take an early retirement. If I wanted to get in early, I had to get out of high school early. So I started college a little bit young and immature. Yeah. Uh, How old were you? I started when I was 16, and I, I got out when I was about 21 or so. Yeah, um, I started when I was 17. Okay. I know what you're talking about when you say immature. Yeah. Uh, I was also sick a lot as a child. Uh, I had a lot of, of uh, ear issues and operations and such. Um, and, that, and that always sort of, sort of kind of interrupted life in a way at inopportune moments. Uh, so when I graduated college, um, I sort of fell in between the cracks, you could say, because uh, it was in 92, economic times weren't very good. Um, and I was pretty much at a loss at what to do. I was still young enough that I was, uh, I wanted to do everything. I was in a state of flux. I wanted life to be loose, elastic. I wanted to be able to go and, and all these different directions, uh, and I didn't know how to do it, and I'd never really done anything 
for any great duration with any sense of confidence or any sense of, of luck. Um, and uh, after I got out of college, I got off of health insurance, I became sick again. Uh, I had to go on welfare. This was at the time when you were a welfare queen, if you had to go on welfare. Yeah. When you're on welfare, you're not allowed to, to work. They don't want you to make money because then you don't get medical aid. So uh, it was a lot of working under the table to make some cash to figure out what's going on to pay for, to deal with this medical situation, which I dealt with. Uh, and then the internet happened uh, about 95. Um, and suddenly everything that I had done as a child that I was embarrassed about or I couldn't relate to with any other kids my age, suddenly it all came to the forefront again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> suddenly it was, um, this is something I need to revisit, it's something I know, it's a world I know. And uh, I was living with four bartenders and a bar back and they would come home every night, last call, and bartenders like to drink after they come home. So they would raise hell all night long and, and had lots of money in their pocket, which was good for them. And I was, I rented a room out with these guys, and they were all, they were all very nice guys. Uh, but I was trying to dial up at 9600 baud on the little Mac SE10 to get into news groups and pine email and sell books in news groups, which was this you know, novel way of, of doing, doing things. Uh, and that seemed to be viable. Uh, the first book I sold online was Sourdough Jack's Cookery, which is a little spiral-bound cookery book to a guy in Alaska who ended up being a collector of anything dealing with Alaska and be, be, became a good friend of mine. Hmm. It's uh, funny how we all sort of remember the first book we sold. Yeah. I, you know, you can't, uh, if you go to a drugstore and ask the chemist, what was the first uh, prescription you, you sold, you wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about. But, right. But we, we remember stuff like that. Right. So it was, it was, it was very odd because I was, I was essentially hiding out in this, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of booksellers you know, we'll say, oh, that guy, you know, he's, he's very established now, but he started out in his bedroom, but don't tell anyone. I started out in my bedroom. I mean, so I, what? So what? Who cares? Um, uh, books started to sell. Uh, at the time, I would go to library sales, book sales, buy a book for 50 cents, sell it for $4, $5, $7 eventually said, maybe I'll get an office. That was a huge step, just the idea of doing that. Uh, eventually, I got an open shop, because I felt like I needed to be validated. Yeah. yeah. I felt like I wasn't legitimate. Uh, I, I remember once when I was, when I was and I, I was in this office that was rented out by a Baptist church, and it was a very Kind of a, again, it was a similar situation where you're, you felt like you were hiding out from the world. You know, you weren't yeah. interacting. It was, it was very isolating. Uh, like going out to the provincial bookseller in pre-internet days who, that was his fiefdom. And, and you know, these guys were in, in, uh, on their own planet as far as what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I remember, remember one day I, I got a call from, from Dick Cavett who ordered... Uh, who ordered education of a poker player. And I said to myself, my God, I'm somebody. I've <laughs> sold the book to Dick Cavett. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I think yeah. after, that, after that moment, I said, you know, I should have an open shop, you know, because I should, I should have a physical presence. So um, you opened the shop where? I opened a shop in downtown Newark, Delaware, the last, uh, by the University of Delaware, the last bookseller who did that who closed his shop, whose shop I used to go to when I was a little kid, said he would have better luck selling turnips <laughs> than the books. And he was, he was essentially right. Uh, but it was, it was a general open shop. Uh, the thing that, 
absolutely, it was very small, it was less than 900 square feet. The, the thing, thing that absolutely amazed me, uh, people wanted to buy books on um, Nostradamus and witchcraft and palmistry and the classics. So that was, you know, that was the, the diet that I had to go out and find, find this material and, 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 and feed these people with. Uh, you know, they were interested. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say it was a, an environment of people who came into the shop that were narrow-minded and closed-minded, but it just, seemed, it just seemed that 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 was the kind of material that they wanted. Uh, and after a while, I got a little bit... Um, it wasn't... It, I realized I wasn't a people person on a day-in, day-out kind of <laughs> level. I just didn't want to... I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, I just couldn't deal with all the different kinds of personalities. I can't even deal with my own personality, let alone dealing with people coming in all the time and, and such. How um, long did you have this open shop? Three years, closed in 2001, September 11th hit. Uh, you never thought of reopening somewhere? No, I think that you was it. Enough. I I had enough and, and also, I was starting to get into the auction scene as a participant, not as a kid attending auctions, but as a participant. And I was, everything that I've ever done has always been based on uh, it's, it's been based on a feeling in the back of my head that something isn't right. There has to be something else. There has to be another way. Something, there has to be another world out there. And when I got out of the library book sale world, it's like, there has to be, you know, why isn't so-and-so bookseller here? He knows what he's doing. Why doesn't he go to this sale? You know, why, or why doesn't he, and then it was, why doesn't, why don't I see so-and-so at these local auctions? And reasoning through why these people weren't here at different parts of the food chain uh, kind of helped me in a way. And I started to figure out you know, what was going on at each step. You know, stopped going to yard sales, stopped going to estate sales, stopped going to, to book sales. Not that I have any problem with anyone who did at the time go to them or, or still yeah. still does, um, but I just um, felt like uh, there was another way of doing it and I wanted to know what, what that way was. Do you issue catalogs? I do. I on a regular basis or irregular? Uh, they're getting more regular. I issue about three catalogs a year. Uh, I'm a catalog-based business, I would say. Uh, Do you I, have an internet presence? Not as much as, 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 as I used to. I, I, I think I'm, for, at the age, that, or for the generation that I'm, I'm in, I, I, since I got on the internet early and I saw all the transformations, everything that happened, I respect it, but I'm kind of still wary of it. And since I came up in the world of my mother getting AV Bookman every Thursday and oh, yeah. locking the door and we have to stay out and seeing that kind of book selling uh, and how that operated, uh, I kind of, I mean, I feel very ambivalent about the internet, but I, at the, I, 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 I'm not sure how it fits in, in my plan and my business. Um, but the days of listing on databases, 7,000 titles, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to be doing that again. Uh, uh, so most of your business is, is done through your catalogs. I would say so, yeah, and fairs. How many fairs a year do you do? Uh, I do about two or three. Do you, um, just ABA fairs or do you do a regional? I do a couple of regional fairs, um, primarily up in New England area. And where? Uh, New England area, yeah. primarily. Um, this year I did the San Francisco fair, which was uh, interesting. Um, but three, three to five fairs overall, I would say. Okay, um, let me ask you, uh, 
one of the things that, that I've noticed uh, is that in the older days, when I'm talking 25 years ago, you'd be very hard pressed to see any visual material at a book fair. Now you can walk around a book fair like this and you can see an awful lot of visual posters, record albums, mm -hmm. pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think this is the wave of the future? No. no. I just think it's just one wave of many waves. Really? Yeah. You, you, uh, you're confident that there'll always be a rare book uh, business? <sighs> yeah. I am, and, 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 and I, th I think the reason I do is because I went through a period of hand-wringing and about this subject, and then I realized that those before me have wrung their hand, hands, and those, I, I, it's, it's, it's just another iteration, I think, is what's going on. I mean, it's, it's whether it's piles of paper or antiques or objects, it's, they're just objects being moved from point A to point B from one generation to the next and the material's always there. There's always someone who's gonna, I think, who's gonna rediscover something, whether it's, it's, it's Martha Stewart or it's, it's, a, it's the next generation mm -hmm. of, of booksellers. As long, as long as the material can manifest itself and doesn't get obliterated by you know, a neutron bomb or, yeah. or a nuclear bomb, it'll, it'll, go, it'll get into people's hands and they'll be curious about it. Um, as you got into the trade, were there any uh, booksellers who you considered to be mentors? Yes, I would say so. It, and I, I, spent, I spent a lot of time uh, kind of groping around you know, blindly the first we all X amount of time. Uh, I started reading catalogs, any dealer catalogs that I could. Uh, and trying to learn as much as I could. Uh, I, I have to give a lot of credit to John Hellebrand for getting me out of this mentality that booksellers were people that hunted and preyed upon each other and that it was this vicious competitive cycle, which at a certain level of book selling, that's what you think it is. You, you're always afraid that someone is taking something from you or that you're being used or someone's making money off you or cheating you. Uh, and he made me realize that the local auction scenes I was in was kind of uh, a rut. And I needed to go where better books were. I needed to go to booksellers who had better books. I, I needed to uh, to get out. Uh, there was a Delaware bookseller named uh, Marvin Balick who recently died. Uh, I remember him waving his hand saying, get out and circulate. I, and at the time, I had no idea what he was talking Wait, about. Now. Yeah. But I do now, you know, get out and expose yourself and expose your weaknesses and someone comes along and wants to uh, uh, use your, your ignorance to ridicule you, then so be it. But, <laughs> but there were indeed people out there who wanted to help and, and mentor you. Uh, uh, Bob of Rubin has been a tremendous uh, mentor to me, I think. Yeah, Bob's, Bob's a good person. Yeah. He's, he's, he's taught me a lot uh, about evaluating material, not, not in terms of money, but just in terms of just trying to be creative and interpretive. Yeah. Look for things that other people don't see. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's always been, he always has had many interesting things in his inventory that, you know, you wonder, where the hell did you get this? You know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, talk a little bit about your inventory. Uh, what are your strengths? What do you uh, particularly like to deal in? Uh, generally speaking, I, I, I deal in 18th and 19th century Americana, that being such a broad yeah. 
rainbow. Um, but what I like to deal in is other people's problems or things that are not known bibliographically or which have a mystery or a potential for discovery, a process of discovery. Uh, things like um, journals, diaries, manuscripts, account books, broadsides. I love broadsides with, with content as well as aesthetic appeal, uh, pamphlets. Um, a lot of people say that my material is, is visual. I don't consider myself to be a visually oriented person. I'm, I'm looking for a story that I can tell that is not something that is being cribbed from another bookseller's description. Right. I, I don't want to have material, that, with all due respect, that you have had. Right. Because I understand. Yeah. Perfectly. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I want something that, that I can take the football, carry it down the field a little bit, let someone else take it and go with it. But, but I want to have a proprietary control over the content if the material lends itself to that. Uh, if, I, if I see a great copy of a book, which is a standard work, and you know, I'll, I'll pick it up. But my heart is in material which has uh, a story to be, to be told or developed. I, I completely agree. I just bought the other day a 1917 folio Missouri broadside of a poultry sale. Mm -hmm. But it had this great big huge picture of a chicken in it. I thought it was kind of interesting. It lasted about 30 seconds before it was sold. So I like that kind of stuff as well. The problem is that it's getting harder and harder to come by. I, I don't know if it's getting harder to come by. I, I, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's getting harder to get people's attention, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, if, if you buy unique material or, or things that are unusual or just, you know, odd or striking or whatever, it's, it, it is, in my, in my experience, it's, it's often hard just to, you know, people want to know what is it, you know, is it, is it a fowl or fish? And then you say, well, it's really a kind of a hybrid of both. And you have to explain to them, uh, you haven't seen something like this, but give me half a chance and I'll get the story to you. I think, I think that's, that's the biggest challenge is interpreting the, the material as concisely and as directly as if you have a copy of Gatsby and Jacket. It's a copy of Gatsby and Jacket, jacket is yeah. what it is. What's there to say? Yeah, yeah. You know, how cute is the jacket? Does it have any yeah. spots on it and that kind of stuff? Right, but I don't, but, but, but I, don't, I, I, I think that, you know, maybe uh, I mean, my personal love is early, you know, 19th and 18th century material, but I'm not opposed to pushing the bar into the 20th century. I'm not, there's so much material there which hasn't been really uh, yeah, explored. Right, right. So I think it's there, it's just a question of can you make it relevant and can you get people's, people's uh, eyes and, and head wrapped, wrapped around it. Are you gonna to continue to issue catalogs and are you gonna to continue to do book fairs? Uh, yes so to the both. foreseeable future. Yeah. yeah. You, you, find, you find those to be interesting vehicles. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, I can't pick up a phone easily and sell something to someone. It, it normally has to be explained in a catalog or at a fair. Uh, I hope the book fairs go on in some form or fashion. I hope people still read catalogs. I, um, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, all, all I can do when I send out a catalog is hope that it arrives on their desk and in between all the millions of other things that people now have to do in their daily lives, that they'll spend a minute or two and look at something and, and possibly buy something from it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's the best way that I know how to get something out across. I, I don't want to really migrate into uh, creating QR codes for my material, although I'm, I'm told you know, that might be something that people are going to start doing or apps or. Yeah, let's, let's have an app. <laughs>
for a well, PDF or whatnot. Well, we've come to the end of our 30 minutes. And right. thank you very much, Ian, for participating. It was thank very you. interesting. And um, thank you again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.